Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Talking Therapy with me, Devaraj. And uh, this week on the show, I'm very, very excited to have Mr. Dan Lowe, who's an integrative therapist from London. And he's also been very interested in Wilhelm Reich and working with his techniques and integrating him into his work as a therapist. So welcome, Dan. Thank you very much for agreeing mm -hmm. to come on the show. And perhaps we could just start off. You can just tell me a little bit about your journey uh, into how you became a therapist, how you got involved uh, and interested in Reich. Thank you. Sure. Well, the, the interest in Reich preceded the therapy by quite a, a many, many years, in fact. Um, I first, I, I, I think the first time I heard of Reich was reading Robert Anton Wilson um, and um, his book Cosmic Trigger 2, I think, mentioned um, Reich and mentioned his experiences in Reich in therapy, but it also mentioned the mass psychology of fascism, which was a book Reich wrote in the 30s, mm -hmm based on observing the rise of Hitler, uh, because what was in Berlin at the time. And it, it's the first sort of psychoanalyst, attempt to apply the techniques of psychoanalysts to um, mass observation, if you like, to looking at society. And, and he, he, so his kind of lens was, what's the emotional appeal of Hitler? Um, and why that grabbed me, I think, or why reading about it secondhand grabbed me, it was, I've always been interested in politics, but it always seemed a bit, there's always something missing. It's like the emotional life is kind of often pushed out of politics and it, and it can seem very superficial. And that was someone who fused for two. And then a little bit after that, there was a, there was a college course I did. Um, well, my degree, um, which was in kind of cultural studies. And my teacher... Um, one of my teachers um, did a unit where he taught um, the mass psychology of fascism and he put Reich in the context of um, the kind of Freudian left, people like Eric Fromm and people like that, and we looked at uh, mass psychology. And I decided to write my dissertation about him. I thought this guy's an interesting figure. I don't know a lot about him. So I wrote... Um, a not particularly great dissertation, I, I think, about Reich, um, basing it a lot on the work of a guy called Myron Sheriff, who was one of Reich's big biographers. Yeah. Um, and, but as part of that, I did some interviews with some therapists, and one of the people I got to meet through that was a guy called Peter Jones, who is a who was is a former Reich therapist, um, and he's he's now retired, but he was a midwife. And Peter was just is just a ceaseless uh, well of information when it comes to all things uh, all things Reich. Um, he's he was working as a midwife when I met him, and largely to see how Reich's ideas about the body how they played out in the birth process. And he's written a couple of books about that. So um, my friendship with Peter is still ongoing to this day, and we talk regularly. And um, so it was always a theoretical interest. Um, and I started reading, you know, the rest of Reich's books. Um, I've still not read all of them, actually. Um, and that, con yeah, that continued over a long period of time. And about maybe 10 years or so ago now, I decided, I found a, a Reichian therapist in London and uh, who, uh, Deirdre Goff, who's based in Putney. Mm -hmm. And, and um, doing therapy with her was one of those weird things where I'm sure like yourself, I've tried lots of, lots of different disciplines and lots of, you know, tried my hand at lots of different, uh, different regimes of self-work or, or however you want to describe it. And, um, the therapy, it was one of the things that just worked exactly as I, not as I anticipated, but it exceeded my expectations. You know, lots of things you try and you think, oh, I can make this work, I'll have to do this and do this and stick at it for a while and, and whatever, but Reiki and body work, it was just like, oh, right, this is really something. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it really sort of emotionally and person personally transformative, mm. you know, and... 
the reasons for wanting to become a therapist one one is it, simply it's about time for a career change for me um but but secondly i find reich's work so rich and so multifaceted and so interesting and so underlooked so overlooked um that i think yeah it would be nice to contribute in some small way to kind of keep him at work alive because i think i do think he has a number of quite proud, profound things to say about um you know, not just for human condition, not just life, but you know, life in general, life in the broadest sense. Yeah. Mm, mm, thank you. I mean, I guess my main exposure to Reich's history was through also uh, Myron Sharaf's book, uh, mm. Theory on Earth, I think it was called, mm. which is quite a long book, but well written. And it, and, and it kind of seemed just to me reading it, because I, I don't have another way to attribute how accurate it is. But as a therapist, you kind of get used to reading people and, and things like mm. this. And it seemed like to me, like he didn't have too much investment to portray Reich in, in, in a way that, you know, wasn't as he saw him directly. So I was impressed with that book and I haven't, you know, I had some, you know, vague rem memory of Reich, did some little work on it when I was when I was training as a therapist, but that was not a very intellectual course. But you know, one of the things that it strikes me, because like you mentioned, you know, it's it's a very underused and overlooked uh, therapeutic body of knowledge. And Reich himself got kind of marginalized, I guess, or so I see in the book and from, from other accounts, because he went off so much into kind of scientific areas, which were perceived, I guess, by the, because at the time, like the 30s and 40s and 50s or 30s and 40s, you know, Psychology was very new and science had been around for like quite a quite a number of centuries, Isaac Newton and all this kind of stuff. And it already built up a kind of, I guess, hierarchical structure of how science is and this kind of thing. And, and then when Reich went veering into science, you know, he must have rubbed quite a few people up the wrong way. Yeah. And, you know, I just wonder what you thought about uh, this whole, I mean, that certainly was, Reich ended up getting marginalized and even today, you know, a lot of people who are well into, into Reich as therapists or writers, you know, will, will still either, like Israel Lagardi, I think in New Wings for Daedalus, you know, at best just says sort of like, well, I'm not qualified to talk about any of Reich's other stuff, but this stuff I'm going to talk about and it's really great. And, you know, fair play, you know, people are being individuals, but it, it's kind of, a, it, what do you think about the way that Reich got marginalised through his expanding his, his kind of, uh, his, his lens? Well, a number of things, but I suppose the first point would be, to me, that shows, I mean, I don't want to come over like I'm here, I wish the guy, but maybe I will. Um, I, I think it shows the amount of fields that he touched in, um, touched on, it's, it's quite extraordinary. There's the mass psychology stuff, which we've mentioned, there's the therapy stuff, there's later moving into biology, um, there's later moving into physics, um, um, with attempts to manipulate the weather uh, at the end of his career, mm -hmm. which is a bit that strains the um, uh, strains the belief of uh, of uh, the sceptical, um, the all the, you know the cloud busting stuff. Um, so you look, you think, how could one person do so much? Because it's it's just a, you know this is against the background of. Um, of World War Two, World War One, in fact, you know, which Reich fought in, um, moving continents, moving countries. It, it's quite, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary life story, just on its own. It's, an, it's a, it's a fascinating biography. Um, as to what, should I focus on? Do you think on why he got marginalised, or what I think about it? Yeah, what, 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 what you feel about this? What you feel about? About if if you kind of basically agree that he got marginalised partly through his diversity of interests, uh, I think. Um, well, one of the things he said to people, he, he's quoted as saying to people, is that there's a too muchness about him. Yeah. Um, he says, "I am too much. I am hard. I am hard to keep up with." Um, so he recognised that about himself. I think it's because. Let's say you come to work as a therapist and you're interested in the therapy. Um, you can you might read character analysis or function of the orgasm. Um, now, when you take 
a global view of his stuff and you understand it, you can you I can see clearly why he moved into biology. You know, he moved into he moved, he was he was looking at cell biology. Um and he was looking at that because he was interested in what are the fundamentals of life, what what are the basic life processes. So he thought, well, let's go back to basics and and try and look and and try and discover that. And that came out of an interest of wanting to know um from a psychoanalytic work, he was said, well what actually is animating libido what's driving libido and what is providing me energy for the resistances and he had the idea that it might be a kind of life energy or life force or something like that so he went to look for that in biology and that's it might seem bold you know crossing disciplines like that but he already had a kind of scientific background he was brought up on a farm he was used to doing looking at animals and and you know, he had training in scientific biology. He'd been doing that sort of thing since the early days. So for him, it wasn't a um, it wasn't that radical a crossover. But now, from us looking back um, with this kind of very broken and partial knowledge of his life, we're like, why does someone skip disciplines like that? I don't understand that. Um, and I think if you're coming at his stuff as a therapist, you might well fall down when you get to the kind of biological scientific hurdle and think, I don't understand this, you know. Um, he did a series of experiments in Norway, which uh, called the Bion experiments, which were, lo- which w- were looking at um, the origins of life, basically, or trying to discover something about the origins of life. And he, um, yeah, and that ran, into, that ran into enormous controversy. That was his first big, public scandal all the stuff that happened in Norway and if you're coming out of the therapist I can see why you would stop because he's saying he's talking about microscopes and microbiology and cells and it's like okay you would stop there as for the later attacks um I think it was basically because he pissed off the Stalinists really he was um the same eye that recognised emotionally what was going on with kind of Hitler. He could see the emotional dynamics on the left, you know, on not you know not just the average, you know, your average sort of liberal lefty, but he, but the kind of he recognised the sort of fascism impl- implicit in Stalinism, um, and was an, and was a vocal critic of that. I think you know he called it red fascism in various places and. Um, the person who started a campaign against him in the US, which was Mary Boyd Higgins, she was a card carrying communist um, who was known for um, attacking people and taking people down. So I'm not saying she got orders directly from Stalin, but I don't think she did. But she perceived him as an enemy of the left. Um, and she was the person who initiated the attacks. Um, she wrote an article called The Strange Case of Wilhelm Reich, mm. um, which was published in New Republic in, I can't remember the year, but around 1950. Yeah. And that was the basis of the um, Food and Drug Administration case against Reich. Um, and also he fought it unwisely, I think, in my view. He fought the case unwisely. He said... The court shouldn't have the right to legislate on the existence of organ energy because it's a scientific matter. I'm not, you know, wouldn't let a court say gravity exists or doesn't exist. But so he refused to turn up on court in court. Um, and courts take badly to that. Courts do not like it if you reject their authority and refuse to turn up. So um, he ended up in prison. And uh, he died after nine months in prison in 1957. Mm. So, yeah, it's quite a sad story in a way. And, and that's also, that's one reason why his work is so confusing, I think. Um, all, a lot of people, so when you hit 60, 65 or something like that, and, you, you know, you, uh, a lot of people enter a retrospective phase and they work out what they want their legacy to be, who they want to carry forward their work, um, start publishing the collected editions with commentary and all the rest of it, you know, but that's a sort of recognisable phase in most kind of, you know, uh, big intellectuals. Well, he didn't have that. 
because he was um, he was fighting a legal case when he was sent to prison. Mm. So his legacy is somewhat um, they are tarnished because of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a shame. I mean, he was kind of I guess in, with the uh, court case, and I think I also read that he was. You know, there were people who were, because a lot of people were into Reich's work as well. You know, psychology was a new field. And when Reich, I think he left right at the beginning of World War II for America, uh, you know, 39, something like that. And, you know, he did pick up a lot of students and a lot of people were interested. And, and some of those guys were lawyers, you know, or they knew lawyers, you know. So I guess on some, and, and he refused really, as I understand it, he wanted to represent himself, you know, despite yeah. what's the old admission client who has himself for a for a lawyer right. a fool or, or something yeah. has a fool yeah, yeah, yeah. Like has a fool for a client or something yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah but you know and, and I guess in the same way that he he didn't respect boundaries in in between disciplines you know he was not that was not his thing he was more of a natural polymath which historically was quite was quite common. I think if you look mm. back at famous scientists from the 18th, 19th century, or even Einstein or whatever, you know, they were polymaths. They were skilled at multiple disciplines. You know, um, what was I going to say? But um, yeah, you know, but the same way that he didn't really respect those those boundaries like that, and that was his natural way. He also, it seems, at time maybe, maybe with something like that, you know, just also allowed himself. That, that same kind of principle to influence his judgment about how he would be represented in court. Because, I don't know, just reading Sharaf's book, you know, it did seem that he kind of almost courted his own demise on some level. There was an element of that somewhere, you know, perhaps not to the extremes of which it happened, you know, actually incarceration and, and uh, you know, and subsequently dying not, not so long afterwards. But, um, you know, so it's, you know, you, you, you can almost perceive, I guess, as a therapist, perhaps, you know, I don't know, really, but like, the Reich had kind of, you know, sown the seeds of his own destruction somewhere in some of his behaviours. But I mean, I don't know what you think about that. What kind of man do you have a sense of Reich himself being as a person to like be around or work with, if you imagined himself, yourself rather, as like a student of his or something like that in the in the 40s or something in America, what kind of guy do you think Reich would have been like? Most of the biographies that I've read, um, it's really striking because they all comment on his immense vitality. They all comment on how much energy he had um, and how, and if you look at the way he manages to get himself back on his feet, you know, after immigrating to America and, um, and you look at, you know, after even, you know, the family home was kind of, um, uh, I think the, the property was, um, I can't remember the word for it, when uh, a military conquest happens and were annexed, that's right. Um, I think the, the family property was an annexed in the First World War. Yeah, he goes to Vienna, builds himself up as a medical student, um, relocates uh, to several countries, does the same thing again. I get a sense of him as someone who's been tremendously vital and full of life. You also get the sense that, um, I also get a sense that probably not a lot of time for small talk and not a lot of time for um, social, the social nice, not the everyday politenesses um, and social nice. I'm not saying he was a rude person or anything, but his work was the central thing for him. And that was, and that seems to come out in his behaviours. He was someone who is like, I'm making a contribution to, I'm making a great contribution to the sum total of human knowledge. Um, this is, and that's going to dominate most things, you know, that's going to, that's, yeah. So I get, well, Myron Sharif called, um, refers to, what he says, he calls it the origin of the mission. And that was Reich. When Reich was 12, he kind of caught his tutor having an affair with his uh, mother. Um, and he told his father about that. And, uh, you know, there was some domestic violence and the mother eventually ended up committing suicide. 
so there's that sort of, sort of sexual trauma, very Freudian kind of um, murder of a mother at, at, at the almost of the sort of genesis of his personality. And someone with an event like that, you know, um, to read it in sort of crude psychoanalytical terms, maybe that was the engine that drove his sense of mission. And maybe that's the kind of man he was, um, was someone who was engaged in trying to fix that and sort that out. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember what actually happened with Riken is because, of course, as therapists, and you're running a load of therapists, and of course, they all want to, you know, pour deeply over your own childhood. And yeah. I think Freud himself was famous for refusing to ever be psychoanalyzed or something like that, I think. And uh, I suspect Reich may have been a bit the same. Yeah. But, um, yeah. what is it, Engine? I mean, because it, it just reminds me personally, I seem to remember in character analysis, you know, he, he only, he, he unveils four different personality types, as I said, character types, character structures, as I recall. And then somewhere along the line, and I've asked a few people about this, I'm hoping to ask um, Fred Lowen about it, uh, Alexander Lowen's son at some point, because mm -hmm. I think I'm, we're doing an interview, but it was not really clear to me or any other therapist where, where the fifth one came from. And I seem to recall reading, but I can't remember where, but the fifth one was, do, was uh, which was originally called the psychopath, rather somewhat extreme, mm -hmm. like some of the other names, somewhat pathologizing, but generally is kind of called more the aggressive type or something like that mm -hmm. these days. Uh, may have come from one of his students as some kind of commentary on Reich. And, mm -hmm. and, what, and, and what reminds me is in, in that kind of personality type, which is not so easily tracked to very early childhood, but one kind of consistent uh, element of it usually is that the child trusts some, somewhere between the age of kind of five and ten in the egoic phase trusts very deeply a a one of the parents or other mm. caregivers and then something happens which breaks that trust you know such as they find out they're being manipulated by the person or something like this or used in some kind of used in some way and you know the level of pain that's felt by a child who's been so trusting and then suddenly seen it, 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 it's squashed particularly when this harsh environment going on around them is there's, there's no one else they can re really trust the level of pain causes them to kind of elect inside okay i'm going to be totally self-reliant from now on and mm -hmm. i'm never going to trust another human being and i'm not going to show vulnerability so i don't know that that just reminded me when yeah. you're describing that that, that mm -hmm. of his relationship with his dad and his mum but i mean i mean who knows i mean something i kind of Something that struck me, I recently was recommended a book, I think it's even like a Netflix series or one of these things now, The Mosquito Coast by Paul Theroux, American writer. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of set in the 80s about this, there's this chap, I think his name is Ali, Ali Fox, and he's a dad, and he's like an inventor, you know, and he's totally against the kind of 70s consumer culture where everything's got a fixed life expectancy, planned obsolescence. He wants to create the best inventions and he gets so kind of, pissed off of America, he ends up taking his whole family on a banana boat to Honduras and starting his own kind of colony in, in the middle of a jungle in Honduras, you know. I think it's been made into some kind of cereal now, but, and it all goes wrong and there's stuff happening, but the enduring image I got of Ali Fox and this kind of personality type was that they will always go against the current. That's kind of where he ends up trying to get up this river, mm -hmm. constantly refusing to go with the current, to go with the flow. And yeah, that's a kind of a sense I have of Reich somewhere, that he's a man who instinctively would not just follow the flow, you know. I, th I, th I think that's true. Um, there's also, I don't know, have you ever seen Ilse Orf, or, or, I can't say her surname, she was wife of Reich's second wife? Yeah. Ilse Orlandoff, or, 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 I can't pronounce it properly. She's written a really nice biography of Reich, which makes him seem, which humanises him. Mm. quite a lot and, and she says yeah it absolutely was driven it was very vital but I almost think the, the combative aspect of him I came out in interacting with elements of our culture and authority structures and you can kind of sometimes when you read about him with colleagues you can see a different possibility how he might have been different mm. but he was in 
he was in combat early with the Communist Party, the Psychoanalytical Association, um, Norwegian scientists, the Norwegian scientific establishment. And then when he came to the States, he, he's got this kind of, according to Myron Sharif, um, he's got this kind of quite naive belief in the openness of American society, you know, the American dream and, and the kind, and um, he doesn't see any of the sort of malign aspects of American society, but he, he, he sees it as um, a space where he's going to be very free to be open. And maybe there is a degree of naivety in his, uh, or, or thinking he was going to be rescued or something like that, in his dealings with the American legal system. He didn't realise how. So there's that aspect to him as well, mm -hmm. possibly, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I also do have a sense of him, not, you know, not as a man who's just hardened, you know, yeah. in that kind of rigid thing, but someone yeah. who cries, who has deep emotions and, yeah. and, and, and who allows them and allows people to see them. So yeah. I do have a sense of him like that. Yeah. But that's the thing that, that I really value in the work, I think could be highlighted more. I don't always... I can see it because I'm looking for it, but um, there's an aspect in the bodywork. Uh, one of the things I really like about it is gentleness. The fact it is very, the fact that it can be very gentle and it can be a very soft process. And that whole idea of Reich's phrasing, um, the use of the word armor, I sometimes think is problematic because what do you do with armor? You sort of break it, you 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 sort of you you snap it or you pierce it or something like that. And some of the accounts of body work that you read, they are this very sort of aggressive assault on muscles, but on you know muscular armor. Um, but I have a nice pamphlet somewhere by a guy called William West, and um, it's called Melting Armor. Mm. I think that's a an interesting title, an interesting use of phrase. The idea that um, it's gentleness and this stuff is melted, it's not broken or snapped or, or sorted or pushed through. There's, mm -hmm. there's a kind of softness there. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't always see that in Mike's character, that softness, but I definitely have seen it in the therapeutic work. And I, I think it's kind of uh, undervalued. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure from, Reich's own work but I mean in, in my own work as a therapist and just kind of thinking about these things it always struck me that this notion of armor was only one side of the story anyway because whilst you do have a lot of individuals who get armored and have that kind of rigid you know de defense you know there are also people who parts of their muscle system literally just just lose all tone right. you know, literally mm -hmm. In the same way, kind of an animal has two choices in, in a sense of facing a predator and perhaps mm. tree, but one is to kind of tense, you know, mm. prepare for action, and the other is to kind of play dead, like, mm. hey, Mr. Predator, don't bother with me, you know, mm. and, and, and this kind of thing just kind of fade into the background. It seems that in our muscle system, a similar process is at work, or it seems something like that to me. I never really developed the idea massively, but w when I've written stuff about about uh, bioenergetics and, and Reiki and work, you know, I've, I, I usually make it clear to put, put out both sides, but it is not simply that armor is, is wrong or something like that, but there's this, there's secondary, you know, and in, in fact, you know, people with a, the kind of detoned muscles are often in more extreme state than, than, mm -hmm. than the, uh, the mm -hmm. ones who are kind of super armored, the super armored ones, at least kind of that their stuff is right on the surface, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's well, if there's an there's, there's, if we think about that from an energetic point of view, there's an, there must be an energy to drive muscular tension. Mm. Whereas something something's flaccid, is there's there might be an absence of energy. There's nothing there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the other, you know, I mean, it's a little bit of a diversion, I guess, but one of the other things is, you know, that. One of the ideas that seems to me to come out of sort of 20th century psychology was the idea that there's kind of, you know, a good way to be a kind of perfect mm -hmm. personality because you're always looking at aberrations and then you naturally kind of think, you know, whether it's Freud and neuroses or, or Reich and character structure, you know, if you got rid of the aberrations, then I would be okay. Therefore, if you got rid of the aberrations, then 
society would be okay. And I think on some subtle level since the 50s and 60s, you know, a lot of societal change has been driven, driven by this kind of understanding. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not sure that it's quite so simple personally, you know, uh, mm. but, but um, uh, you know, it's like we're, we're, we're kind of coming up, I see, against uh, an age when we have, you know, de-traumatized childhood quite extensively, but it's not, it's not clear for me that that's necessarily a successful process. You know, but uh, anyway, that's a little little beyond where I think Wright got to. But um, uh, I, I also kind of wanted to ask you, what, yeah, I mean, do you feel that Wright has been ex extensively mischaracterized or demonized? Do, what yeah. about the idea that he's kind of been made into a martyr? That's something I see a bit around some kind of areas of a sort of conspiracy scene a bit. I, I, I'm not sure about the martyr thing. But I do think there has been a trend um, since really, since since Mildred Eddie Brady's article in the 50s to characterise him as, as a madman. And that, is, and that carried on. Even, um, I haven't read it yet, but Olivia Lang had a new book out. Yes. Out. Um, have, you, have you read it? I haven't read it, no. I remember hearing about it about three or four months ago. Yeah, well, well she... There was something in the Guardian. I read a piece by her in the Guardian, and um, it said, "She said, of course, I was appalled by his pseudoscience, by which I meant, which means to me, you didn't read it, you didn't understand it." Uh, I who, get. Who, who said this? Olivia Lang. Olivia Lang. Yeah, she said, I was appalled by his pseudoscience, and I thought, well, that screams out to me that you didn't read it. Um, and if you did read it, you didn't bother to cultivate a sympathetic reading of it. But she seemed to go down the, the same route, oh, right, was mad. And him being mad is the only way you can preserve that narrative. You know, you can only... You can only kind of say he was wrong about everything and he wasn't seeing these things if they're schizophrenic productions. Um, and you read his work, it's just like... That's not the case. It's just evident. It leaps out at you. I was reading the Bion experiments um, last week and the clarity around the observations, the ability just to speak clearly about what he's seeing, to pursue a point um, across multiple experiments, as well as actually setting up the experiments. And this guy, as well as referencing the work of others that have gone before him, a lot of kind of biologists um, who wouldn't be known to us now, partly because of the German language thing, but partly because we just lost the history. And it's like this characterization of this person as mad it is wrong, and but it fulfills a narrative purpose mm. in that we can then bracket hold him off and he's made less dangerous because it's about his individual pathology. And we don't have to contemplate any of the things that he, he was doing. So I think he's commonly mischaracterized in that way. And that's the popular understanding of him. And that's why a lot of the time I think Reichian people to me can seem overly defensive because they're so used to that representation. Like I know you mentioned Warren, Warren Sharif's book. There's a, there's a good talk. Um, that's sort of a critique of Sheriff's book. Um, I can't remember the name of a guy, Brzezinski, I, I think. It's, it's a YouTube lecture, I can send it to you. Um, and he's really, really critical of Sheriff as misrepresenting Reich as he sees it. And I listened to it and I was like, I can sort of see what he's saying, but wow, he's a bit over the top. And I wondered if that kind of need to defend Reich from, these conti from the continual slurs leads people to become more entrenched. So maybe, I, I don't know if that relates to the kind of martyr thing that you were talking about. Um, I mean, I, I, th I think you're right in that, that that happens. And it's, yeah, I'd forgotten to read um, Olivia's books. I heard about it just before it came out. I mean, she, yeah, it's a shame without wishing to go into further categorizations. Of course, she's a, she's a Guardian writer. And, 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 you know, I mean, I read The Guardian myself or The Observer, certainly, but like, they, they do have this kind of I, somewhere because it's an intellectual fantasy, you know, but there is a perfect way to, for humans to be. And it's kind of the core of the intellectual side of left wing thought in some ways, you know, whereas that I don't know if that's really the case. 
So it's a it's a shame she went down that road, but uh, yeah. But I said, look, I'd like oh. to. What, what what did you think about her book anyway? Was it? Oh, I haven't read the book yet. I read the, I read an article by her in the Guardian, and oh, I, I, think found it, I right. found it so disappointing that I thought I didn't I didn't want to read the book. I mean, one of the things she said, she got the. She said I, I was appalled by his pseudoscience, and I was like, oh well, which I can kind of get. But like, also in the midst of COVID, you know, so there may have been yeah, some. Weird... But, I can kind of get someone saying someone not understanding the scientific work and not doing the sign not doing the scientific experiment. Who's going to do that? You're a minority person if you're going to build an organ accumulator or mm. acquire a microscope. I can sort of mm. I can get that. But then she she said a load of stuff. She said he was sent to prison for um refusing to stop selling the organ accumulators. And I'm like, that's just not true. That's just that's not what happened. That, that, that's, that's uh, you know, maybe charitably, I could say maybe she was edited out for clarity, um, limited space in an article. And, but yeah, I mean, that's just not true. It's a massive simplification mm. of what happened. So, mm. yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, it reminds me to read her. I mean, I kind of, um, from having a few run-ins with The Guardian over the years and had the odd article written about me once and some other work I did. I mean, they have this thing, which I'd always go back on, which is journalistic balance. In the, mm. You can never be just totally positive about something in The Guardian. Yeah. You just can't do it. You're not allowed mm. to do that. You can mm. be super positive for quite a lot of it, but then you need to end on a bit of neg. Or you're more likely positive for a while, neg for a while, and then this kind of balance mm. finish. So they have this kind of format mm. for writing things, you know? Yeah. They will never totally slag something 100%, and they'll never totally praise something 100%. It's just, mm. in a certain ways, the nature of the mind as yeah. well. But it's kind of reminding me to have a look. But with the martyring, what, what, what I saw a bit, you know, being immersed in alternative culture for a long time, I dropped mm. out when I was like 21 and yeah. didn't start therapy until I was about 39. So I had a long time kind of as a punk and a squatter and a protester and this kind mm. of thing in London. And, and certainly Wright got categorised because he kind of fitted into the kind of the life arc of the typical kind of martyr uh, in, in a certain sense that you perceive it a certain way, but he was fighting authority, you know? I mean, I think the mass psychology of fascism actually shares the kind of, um, or, or is one of the few books, I mean, it was banned by the Nazis, mm. banned by the communists, and then I think the Democrats in America, the Americans banned it as well, I think. He's, 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 I've said, um, well, I've heard it said and quoted it myself, but he, he shares the, um, the joint distinction of being the only person who had his books burnt by the Nazis and burnt by the US government. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so he kind of fitted into the kind of narrative arc or the, the perceptual arc of life of, of the average martyr, you know, is fighting yeah. the system, fighting the Nazis, fighting the communists, fighting the Americans at a certain point, which is very good kudos if you're in the alternative left, you know, and then of course dies in prison and numerous theories abounding that really the American government have secretly sneaked someone in there to kill him or whatever, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of holes in his areas where where that kind of narrative can come in and right the martyr comes out and i've i've certainly heard a few people yeah. make mark out to be make right out to be the martyr but um i get i guess the reality is that he's he he's lost from view for 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 a large number of people i was i wrote something on substack about right or something on somewhere and some some psychoanalyst said to just she was about 60 or something in the stage and she goes oh yes I remember right we did him we did like one we did a couple of days on him in my psychology training yeah. back in the 80s or 90s or something but I guess for you know now he's been lost to view for anyone studying psychology these days it probably wouldn't get more than a mention really uh, yeah. I, I guess it's, it's interesting I always look for um references to him uh, in my own reading and he he does seem to be he rarely turns up in indexes um in most of the contemporary psycho, psycho uh, not so much it will be in the psychoanalytic stuff but more the kind of mainstream counseling therapy stuff he's very kind of invisible um and i'd put that down to the court case and imprisonment you know um People assume there was some truth in that. They, they assume that, um, yeah, he did go balmy or whatever. Um, let's not go there. Let's not look at his his later stuff. The psychoanalysts are, are different. They'll, they'll say it's all okay up until character analysis and don't read the last third of the book. Um, 
which is the most interesting bit. Um, but yeah, so he's still in there. But um, even psychoanalysis, you know, old school psychoanalysis as a diff as a discipline, that seems to me to be much less popular than it used to be. Uh, dying, but why? Why? One of the things I think is interesting at the moment, what's happening is um, there's a resurgence of interest in the body. Um, yes. With you know probably the most famous. Um, yeah, example of that is Bessel van der Kock's book, you know, The Body Knows the Score, and, and people are, are aware, and there's all the kind of polyvagal theory stuff, and Stephen Porges, and um, Babette Rothschild stuff with trauma work. So there is this kind of return of the body, um, or, well, it's not new, but it's been going on for a while, but and so I suppose one of the things I'm trying to do is maybe make links between that stuff and Reich, which you, you can't make a direct intellectual link, but I'm saying, well, this guy was a predecessor. Um, but one of the one of the things, for instance, um, you know, EMDR, eye yeah. movement and desensitization, um, that's in Reich, basically. It's in Reich in work with the ocular segment. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. The techniques are the same. Yeah. So... He's tapped into something that she's, that I can't remember the founder of that, the name of formerly founded that discipline, but Reich has tapped into something that was later spun off into a whole discipline by someone else. But um, yeah, one of the things I'm interested in, in is making those links again. Mm -hmm. saying, well, this guy, you know, maybe he's a predecessor that's worth looking at. Mm. Well, of course, it, I mean, if you ask me, I mean, personally, then, I mean, the whole, if you're going to look at anything to do with body-based therapy in out of the West, you know, because you could yeah. go to shamanic cultures, you could go to South America, Siberia, India, mm -hmm. and find other routes, and and, 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 and and you may find similar work as well from before, but otherwise it all goes back to Reich. You know, it's all yeah. going back to Reich, basically, simple as that, you know, and, 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 and he is really this kind of fountainhead source uh, in his original work and then also the people he inspired whether it's radix or bioenergetics or whatever the people that came through him and out Gerda Boyson uh, in London and and uh, you know so he's this kind of fountainhead you can't you can't really avoid Reich in, in, in a sense you know and I think I mean we've been kind of stuck a little bit in our culture for a while in the kind of cultural aspects where and you didn't really get this, I don't think, when, when in, in earlier days where in, in the old days, it was a little bit like you'd have a person in their personality, who they were, mm -hmm. and you had a person's work. And they were kind of separated a bit more than they are now. Mm -hmm. And now you've got, you know, if, if, you're, if your personality is a bit suspect by today's rules or you made some dodgy tweets 20 yeah. years ago or whatever, then your work also gets hurled in the dustbin along with you. Mm. And I think that will change. I suspect that will change, that a maturation will come in the, mm. in the culture war scene mm. where we no longer need to quite do that, you know, uh, and that, uh, and I, I mean, I have quite a strong feeling that Reich is on the way back, basically, yeah. personally. I mean, that's, of course, I'm, I've got a slightly prejudiced perspective in that, you know, I'm creating a YouTube channel for some 6,000 odd, odd, odd people, subs, and like, you know, most of them are already interested in this work. But I mean, a lot of people are, are, are seeing the issue. We've had these kind of decades of expansion of therapy into the mind, you know, from CBT onwards. I think Aaron, Aaron Beck just passed away, I think. But like, anyway, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's all good stuff. But it, 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 the, the early promise, you know, that you could just change everything by working with your thought patterns and beliefs, NLP as well, you know, it's like, it, it, it's pretty clear now that that's not really yeah. the case, or certainly maybe it is the case for a minuscule number of people, but for the average human being, it's absolutely not the case. And that for some, it's even counterproductive in that it creates more of a mind-body split, that their mind gets positive, but the body is still holding on to all of this stuff. So... And at the same time, you know, mainstream psychology is kind of on the down a little bit, you know, and it, it, as I perceive it, science is a bit on the rise, you know, science is starting to get more deeply into the gut, there is, it hasn't really studied before the gut brain axis and this kind of thing. And was, I mean, if I look at my own mailing list of about, it's only about eight, 900 people, which is not really big for male chimp and stuff, but there's quite a few hard science pros on there, 
you know, mm. who are just interested in this work and interested in working with the body. And I think mm. we, we could come to a position soon where hard science starts to move into, into the real bio and the Reichian stuff a bit mm. in its own way, uh, uh, partly probably because scientists themselves are, are, are quite scared usually of psychology on a personal level and investigating their own uh, things a little bit much. And so the body work is kind of a bit more attractive to them, you know, going straight into the body to correct things. I don't know exactly. I'm just kind of spouting off a few ideas, but I have a sense that the body is about to come back in quite a strong way and possibly a bit more detached from the psychology. Because, of course, with Reich and also with Lowen, I mean, the two were going hand in hand. You know, you could not, you know, take out the kind of Freudian elements. You know, it was it was it was purely. It was it was absolutely a mixture, and you had to do you had to do both, you know, the body corrective work, the character analysis, and the Freudian type of a psychoanalytic analysis of the, the childhood. Yeah. 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 What, what, what do you have a sense of the future with, with, with Reich and stuff? What's your comments? Well, one, well, two things really, I suppose. One thing I agree I, I agree with you: the body is absolutely making a, a, a kind of resurgence, and Reich, well, you know the fountain at the back in the West, as, as you say. One of the things Sheriff says is one of the reasons he thinks, he says Reich's work is true and has validity is because it paid dividends in so many theoretical areas. Um, you know, he found stuff in cell biology that was worth thinking about. He found stuff in um, applied to the study of politics and fascism, et cetera, et cetera. And one area that my friend Peter has worked on, which I'm tremendously excited by is um Reich and midwifery mm -hmm. um, he worked as a midwife yeah. uh, mid midwife um and basically it's largely using breathing to keep women in a parasympathetic state mm -hmm. while they give birth so and an awareness of armoring particularly armoring around the hips and the genitals to so i'm thinking how might these things be impacting on the process of, of birth um and allowing lots of movement around the birth process. So things like that, I think, are tremendously exciting because they go beyond the bounds of therapy. It's not about therapy anymore. I mean, this is why, why Reich excites me generally, because if I ever write a book about him, which I hope to do, I would, I would like to go look at how many areas this touches on, from the genesis of life in biology, um, through to birth, through uh, midwifery, then even into education with, say, A.S. Neil. Neil wrote about seeing pupils of his go back to their home environments, which were disruptive, and seeing them come back with uh, tightened bellies. So he, he, how armouring is instilled socially, and then you've got the mass psychology stuff. So it's this amazing um body of work when you begin to see all the areas that it fits into and that's what excites me personally but the other thing i would say is if if you take him seriously um why it would be what will be a taboo for a while yet um for people from a conventional scientific background um it's because of the idea of orgo um which um as we all know doesn't exist according to the pure flux worldview but you know you build an all ground accumulator and go and sit in one it's a it's a different story so and until sheriff's book's interesting because he talks about um thomas coon and the idea and uh paradigms and he uses Reich as an example of a completely different paradigm mm -hmm. i.e the ontology epistemology um and everything else off, off it's just founded on something different and for Reich it's founded on organ energy um and that is a tough pill to swallow um mm -hmm. for if you've got a conventional science background yeah yeah and I guess you know in a, in, 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 in a sense you know it's quite a big pill to swallow as well yeah. you know and I guess yeah. I don't know. I mean, for me, I'm, I've always kind of been, it's got its bad sides as well, it's good side, quite pragmatic with stuff, you know, and sometimes I think with Reich, maybe maybe a series of smaller pills is a more likely way to get, to, yeah. to get, get things back rather than expecting people to eat one big one. Yeah, yeah. that's It's kind of, 
and in a sense that you know gives a justification to some of the to some of the kind of Reich was mad stories you know not that I wish to put perpetuate them myself but you know anyway yeah 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 I there's a really interesting anecdote in um Will uh there's a great book about all the, the history of his persecution called Wilhelm Reich in the Cold War by mm -hmm. Jim Martin. And he gives an anecdote in that of him using a, a thermal imaging camera on an organ accumulator and seeing, oh, it does generate heat. So in a sense, it violates the second law of thermodynamics because for a sense, it is hotter inside. This is an unexplained heat, it's being generated. And that, that, that's with, with no one in it. Yeah, and uh, and it gives an account of the guy he showed it to and, and they were filming this, had to take the organ box apart. He had to pull it apart to find out the, you know, the heating element was apparently concealed in, in there, which wasn't in there. But it's, yeah, it, it's a kind of outrage to um, scientific propriety in a way, you know, the, the fact that this stuff appears to work. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm conscious even talking about it is kind of um, more inviting attacks in a way, you know? Um, so, but, but there you go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, for sure. There is a whole class of kind of, the thing is, you know, I mean, scientists themselves, can at times be quite open-minded, you know, and some can be very open-minded. But also in the West, there's a whole class of kind of people who just get some, on social media, just get some kind of dopamine hit out of finding people who have apparently or delusional beliefs and demanding that they prove them now, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, they get some kind of their reward circuits kind of light up that they found another kind of new age of that they can, that they can, you know, make look an idiot or whatever. But, you know, scientists themselves can be quite open. And there's a lot of good scientists around, you know, who are, who, you know, really interesting characters, Lex Friedman and Andrew Huberman, I follow a bit, you know, not- Yeah, I really like Andrew Huberman stuff, I think he's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, excellent kind of, excellent kind of people. But um, yeah, have you, so have you got a, you got an organ accumulator yourself or is that too dangerous? No, no, no. Like, too, too big for a London flat, I'm yeah. afraid. Um, yeah. I, I've um, my friend Peter's got one in Preston, and um, I've used that like numerous times. I mean, an interesting thing about using it is I don't know if it's where it's situated because it's quite high up. Mm -hmm. um, but you mean high up on a hill? You mean or it, it's 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 in a, a block of flats, so it's so it's altitude. It's you know it must be a couple of hundred feet off, off the ground, and maybe it's an altitude thing. I don't know, but. It, it generates quite a powerful charge. Um, one of the things people don't think about is um, all this stuff is to do with the, the environment and the weather. And on a day like today, where it's quite cold and grey, you're going to get quite you're going to get a lower charge than you would do on a bright sunny day. Um, and on a bright sunny day, you know, you can really feel it. I I can feel it with my hand. Um, without even sitting in the thing, I can, I can get a very clear sense of something happening. Um, yeah, but I'm as I as I say that I'm I'm mentally imagining what me, what how I look to someone who's completely skeptical. Mm. Old Dan can feel this imaginary feeling yeah. with his hand, you know, but. Um, well, I have to sort of stay honest to my own experience, I guess. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. I kind of appreciate, in a sense, in that in, in that context, being a bit more on the outside. You know, I've never attempted to get any kind of mainstream qualification, actually, yeah. and actually shun it because then you're you are controlled by these kind of rather mad rules and uh, whatever and self image and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But I guess then the then the explanation, as I understand it, because I've, I've never been a, a big student of Orgone, but I've kind of read a little bit, is like. So on a sunny day, then like the, the number of bions in the atmosphere is kind of higher or something like this, or the amount of organ no, it, in the atmosphere it's, is it's, it's water. Orgone heads towards, orgone is attracted towards water. So on a cloudy day, there's going to be more humidity in the atmosphere, and that means the charge is going to be weaker. 
Uh huh. But then with the accumulator, is the idea that the organ comes in but doesn't come out again, or something to do with the organic uh, yes. organic layers? Yes, yes. Because of the because of the um, the multiple layers, um, you've got alternating layers of metal and um, anything that's an electrical insulator, um, and um, when the metal reaches a certain point, I think it kind of um, it, it lets the organ go again. Um, it's a really bad explanation, sorry, but yeah, the alternating layers of metal and electrical insulators lead to a higher charge in the in the centre um, because it's attracted to the electrical electric attracted to the metal, then attracted to the electrical insulator, then attracted to the the metal again, then the insulator again, and it will lead to a situation where there's a higher charge. Mm -hmm. uh, in the centre of the box, mm -hmm. um, and all I can say is I can feel that very clearly. Um, so it's a little similar to a greenhouse in some ways, then I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It, yeah. In, but it takes longer to escape. You know? Yeah, 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 entirely. Yeah, yeah, and for, for the energy it appears to have a certain sort of quality. Um, but you can subjectively feel it feels like static electricity, but it isn't, is the nearest I can say. And running very sort of ad hoc scientific tests in, in Peter's, um, one of the things it does is it raises your body temperature quite significantly, which we've measured, you know, um, it, it's a sort of appreciable, you know, um, I can't remember how much it went up, uh, the temperature, but everyone sitting in it reports a small rise in temperature, mm -hmm. which you can measure. Mm. Um, wow interesting interesting stuff i like to yeah i have to get hold of one sometime or i'm kind of traveling a lot at the moment so mm. i'm going to mexico soon i think they used to make from there but that was a long time ago actually mexico is probably the place with the most significant right in scene mm. um out anywhere as far as i can tell <laughs> i can put you in touch i'll put you in touch with someone there's a woman I was in a supervision group with um, called Patricia, Patricia Estrada, mm -hmm. who um, occasionally would find my Cockney London English a bit much, but um, she's really great and Reich is thriving out there. Mm -hmm. So if you want to sit in an organ, if you I'm pretty sure someone will find I didn't know it. That. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I'd it's also love to um to 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 maybe. Uh, chat to this guy Peter that you're, you're yeah, talking about sure. sometimes see if he wants to do an hour interview or something like that about Reich you know I think yeah. It's, uh, yeah I just think it's good to get more of this stuff online for people to mm -hmm. check out for themselves and then they can watch it and if they think it's all loony but it's, it's okay and if they think it's interesting they, that's also okay you know yeah. yeah I'm sure I'll put, I'll put you both in touch um it's really interesting what's happening in Mexico I wish I knew more about it but there seems to be a pretty and we were going to Mexico City. Yeah, I fly into Cancun on some ultra cheap flight in December. And then I was kind of planning, I think, I think I'm free in, till, till like April, May, just to stay probably in Mexico City. But I could also travel around a bit, you know, in Cuyas. Yeah. And... Well, I'll put you in touch with Patricia. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah. Is, is, is the scene kind of centred in Mexico City or is it in a different... I, I believe so. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, she's, got an, she's got an institute out there. There'll be people doing uh, organ experiments, on, wow. I'm sure. Um, wow. <laughs> there, was a there was a conference out there a couple of years ago. Really? Uh, but I, yeah, but I, you know, it's Mexico, obviously I didn't go. Well, but, it's um, great stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'll definitely check that out. I've got to get my Spanish back up to standard and improve it a bit. But yeah. I mean, it's like, a, yeah, cool. Well, yeah. that's, a, that's a hidden bonus, definitely, for yeah. interview. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Is it, um, should we do some wrap up questions, maybe? Or... Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, did you have anything else you'd like to uh, anything else you'd like to to put out? Um, if people, yeah, if if people were curious about Reich, I would say I'd encourage them to read him in the first yeah to read him and read his books which for some reason no one ever does people always ask me what are the best books about right they never say what are the best books by right and i would say read him maybe start with function of the orgasm um and the important thing to recognize is that his work he moved through lots of different stages over his over his career um and if you read some of the early books you're not necessarily getting the full um fully developed right 
but I would encourage people to read him. Mm -hmm. um, if people are interested in the therapy, there's a really good book called Emotional Armoring by Morton Herskovitz, who was Reich's oldest student, um, who only died in, I think, 2018. He was about wow. 100. Wow. Yeah. And his, his book is really, really good and, and short as well. Uh, and if people wanted to get in touch with me, um, I sadly still have uh, not set up a website, but I'm doing so at the moment. Um, and it's danlow72 at gmail, and people are welcome to. Um, uh, or I have a BACP uh, profile. If people are interested in working therapeutically, they can look me up on the BACP site. Um, we can leave a link to that below in the description. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. And that's about it, I suppose. Um, yeah, and I'd encourage people also to read Peter's book, which um, I've given away my last copy of, um, but he's a fountain of knowledge on, on right in the UK, and I'd encourage people to get hold of his book. He's basically, he's done all these little pamphlets over the years um, on, you know, what is character armour, what is organ energy, the bion experiments, and he's, he's collected about 40 of them in a... Uh, book that's about 800 pages long so it's quite a sort of it's a substantial contribution to sort of writing knowledge but it's kind of self-published so um, yeah if people want to get hold of him to get a copy it will be uh, pffj at supernet.com mm -hmm. um, what's the book called or is it the, uh, just a um, series of pamphlets it's called expand it's called expansion and contraction i believe Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really something, I mean, you know. It, um, sounds like I'm picking up a friend, but it's it's you know, twenty thirty years of work. Yeah, no, it's sure, no, it's, yeah. it's 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 totally yeah. fine. It's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can you know, we'll, we'll we'll put some links to all of this, these resources in the description below and in, in, in the video. Yeah, and, and people can get over me on Twitter on Twitter as well. I've I've got a Twitter account that's all going one. Mm -hmm. um, cool. I mean to tweet more Reiki and related stuff and like yeah. Twitter as a platform is such a pain. It's so sort of toxic. I kind of, <laughs> like, yeah, uh, yeah. My, my aspirations for setting up a Twitter account have not yet been realised, but um, it's an easy point of contact. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Dan. You know, I really appreciate you for, yeah. for coming on and making time in your schedule to do this and to, to put the word out about Reich and to you know it's very very beautiful thank you you're welcome yeah, yeah no problem at all yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk to you